man, Henry Allingham, has died. He was 113. His life spanned three centuries and six monarchs. The Queen and the Prince of Wales have expressed their sadness and said he was owed a huge debt of gratitude. Robert Hall looks back at his life. Try to be good at everything. Henry Allingham, as he wanted to be remembered, surrounded by young people eager to hear his story. I've tried hard to leave this world so it knows who we have to thank for our lives today. But this visit to his birthplace in East London was to be one of his last public appearances. He won everybody's respect and he could touch them. And some with astonishment, some was in awe of him. But they all responded to him, especially his smile. Henry Allingham was born in June 1896. A teenager at the outbreak of the First World War, he was to have served as a dispatch rider. But one glimpse of the first flying machines changed his mind. Henry joined the fledgling Royal Naval Air Service as an air mechanic. A year later, he witnessed the great naval battle at Jutland. In 1917, Henry was transferred to France, maintaining aircraft and flying as an air gunner above the carnage that was the Battle of the Somme. I've always said it was the men in the trenches that suffered and the men in the trenches in my book won the war. Nine decades on, Henry defied his advancing years with a series of personal pilgrimages to the old battlefields. I pay homage to those men. Very much. Can't help it. As a survivor of the pioneering days of aviation, Henry also won the admiration of his successors. He was one of those inspirational characters, to be quite honest, and really connects today's Air Force with those previous eras of our history. Henry Allingham was the last surviving veteran who'd volunteered for duty in a conflict that claimed millions of lives. To the end, he was still doing that duty, still determined that those who died should not be forgotten. Well, earlier I spoke to Robert Hall and I asked him about his memories of Henry Allingham. I first met him by coincidence. I was sent to cover his, I can't remember, 109th, 110th birthday, which is in a hotel in Eastbourne. And um, from the minute you meet him, it was, or met him, he clearly was a very special person. He had this wonderful sense of humour. He struggled with his eyesight and his hearing back then as well, but he wanted to communicate. He was full of stories. Um, I think the remarkable thing is that up until about then, just before then, he had shut himself away. He outlived his wife, his daughters, mm. his family were all in the United States. Um, Dennis Goodwin, you saw him in that report, more or less found him and said, come to a veteran's do, and persuaded him to talk about, to talk on behalf of all those who were no longer with us. And Henry quite took to the idea, and, and since then, Really, he built on it, and he did numerous. We followed him to Went school to schools, visits. Didn't yes, he? to school yeah. visits all the way to Germany to meet the last German veteran, Herr Meyer, who since died as well. Extraordinary to see these two mm. old men. They couldn't speak to each other, but they could communicate, and they they knew they'd shared the experiences, and that was what was remarkable. Mm. That he and he could tell the stories over and over again, and there was an insatiable appetite. Schools we went to, you could see the kids, particularly the little kids, looking at him and thinking. Wow, I mean, they'd never seen anybody as old as that. Mm. And people would come, and you'd, there's some images from the, the reports we've done. I like guess a child's hand in his hand sometimes as, as he yeah. spoke to them. He mm. had a real gift in, in drawing them in. And he was still visiting schools mm. up to earlier this year. Yes, he was, yes. We went to the East End to Clapton um, in, near Hackney with him, which is where he was born. And, and what Dennis has been doing over the last couple of years, really, is trying to take... Henry to experiences which he's never had, which have some relevance to his life. So we went there and the kids, loads of questions about how he lived, how he had done, what he would say to them. He just said, be good, he told them. Uh, we went to the cricket ground at the Oval. He, he was very keen on playing cricket in the street when he was a kid. He'd never been there and watched a mm. proper county game. Open mouth. He just, he kept saying, I don't deserve it. He kept saying, I cannot believe that I'm here. This is for other people, not for me, but... You know, I'm grateful for what for the time that people are allowing me 
to, to do these Yes, things. he was very humble, mm. despite his achievements, um, and despite everything that he'd seen, and That's right. was willing to pass on to future generations. That's right, and then some of the stories he told were just... Uh, there was the, the, the loss, the, the, the conditions he'd had to, to be in. I remember him, when we went to the airfield, you saw, and saw just a, few, a couple of brief shots of these old aircraft at Shuttleworth in Bedfordshire. Um, he watched the plane land, the pilot came and shook his hand, and he said, he then went into a story about how he'd seen pilots land with their planes on fire, and they hadn't been able to get them out because the planes mm. were made of canvas and um, alcohol-based um, stuff spread on the canvas, and the planes would just go up and the pilots would, would be burned to death. And he remembered that. Uh, he remembered, uh, he always used to tell a story about a pilot who wanted to loop the loop, and he wasn't really allowed to, and there were no safety belts. So he asked Henry, who was a mechanic or an air engineer, to rig a rope in the cockpit so that he could mm. do it, which Henry duly did. Robert Hall there. And you can watch a special programme on Henry Allingham, The Last Volunteer, at half past nine tonight here on BBC News.